Sysdig is the first cloud-native visibility and security platform that eliminates the need for standalone tools like container security and monitoring. Using Sysdig's unique data approach, enterprises can solve a variety of visibility and security issues at massive enterprise scale for multi- and hybrid cloud environments. Sysdig will enable your organization to scan and block vulnerable images and enforce best practices pre-production, block threats, enforce compliance, and monitor application performance, proactively alert on incidents, reduce MTTR with forensics, and capture Capture detailed audit records, all from a single unified platform. Accelerate your transition to containers and then have confidence in your ongoing operations using Sysdig. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Sysdig. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by Matt Alderman. Synopsys is the leader in application security testing. With 84% of cyber attacks targeting the application layer, securing your software is more challenging than ever. Modern software deployment and development paradigms require security testing solutions that are automated, accurate, and integrated into your DevOps workflow. Synopsys enables DevSecOps with a portfolio of industry-leading tools, including Coverity, Black Duck, and Seeker, to help you build secure, high-quality software faster. Mark your calendars for our Security Weekly Holiday Extravaganza. On December 19th, Security Weekly will be live streaming five one-hour panel discussions with some of the most knowledgeable professionals in the industry. To round out the evening, Ed Scudis will be joining the Security Weekly hosts to give his annual announcement about the CounterHack Holiday Hack Challenge. You can view the live stream on our YouTube channel or by visiting securityweekly.com slash live. We hope to see you there. Uh, I do hope to see you there, and I'm pretty sure we're going to grab John in there as well. So even though we've missed him this week, um, I know, Matt, that I think we can cajole John into joining us for that uh, holiday extravaganza. Yeah, it, we would love all the hosts in studio for that. It's our it's our annual holiday party. It's the last show of the year for us uh, as we get ready for 2020. Uh, I think you two are going to join us remotely because it's a long trip from, from uh, California over to Rhode Island. Uh, but everybody's you know all the hosts are welcome in it's kind of a mix of uh us in studio with some of our remote folks and remote guests it'll be a, a great day actually it'll be a lot of fun yeah it'll definitely be fun because um the security weekly has all kinds of shows and um we we got to hang out with uh business security weekly last week um a little bit and uh, so it'll just be more fun to see more of the hosts and uh talk about security all things security yeah, and I mean, these roundtables are, are trying to hit those different shows and audiences uh, in, in a kind of consolidated day, but it'll give everybody a chance to kind of get uh, information across, right? We're going to do, obviously, one on application security and DevOps, uh, but we're also going to do some compliance. We're going to do red teaming, blue teaming, all the different kind of content we cover on a weekly basis across the shows. Absolutely. Absolutely a fun time. And um, then talking about things that aren't a fun time is um, maintaining up-to-date software. So this is one of the recurring themes of, uh, of this particular show, for sure, um, as well as I'm going to bet for anybody who's doing red teaming or penetration testing, you know, finding old vulns and old software is one of the easiest ways in. And one of the, one of the links I picked up for today's um, uh, list that's on the wiki is a site that's basically tracking end of life software. So um, it's basically just an aggregation of end of life dot date. So it's a great way to use a vanity domain name to track a bunch of different um, stacks. And we were just talking most recently about Python. So for those of you who are still on Python 2, you have, um, you know, one about month and two one weeks, month to... Paul. Exactly. Paul. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Not that the clock is ticking. But uh, but that's exactly why I wanted to highlight this website. It's just it, it's a nice resource in the sense of just um, bringing together a lot of this information. One of the things that I would love to see build from it, or just maybe as a thought exercise with different teams, is one making it, it like having an API on top of it. So this is really you know just static text, and it's just a bunch of links which are great. So that's not to be dismissive of it at all. But to be able to say how the reason I'm going with like API or process is being able to say, now that we know we've got one month and two weeks for Python 2, there is going to be a, you know, Python 3 is going to start in, you know, having its own deprecation steps. And getting in front of these things can be, you know, 
good, <laughs> especially when you're trying to figure out what is sort of the engineering contract to build up and say, we are going to provide support for a particular language for X amount of time. Or once we know that here is a particular uh, language that, you know, language version that's going to be deprecated in one year, what point do we start, you know, moving on, mo moving off of that onto either a different language for that matter, or that, you know, version bump. And so answering those questions when you are a little bit earlier than, than one month in two weeks um, can be a lot more healthy. And it's just one of those ways of building in that DevOps uh, behavior of saying, we want to minimize tech debt and we want to be able to iterate quickly. And by doing so, we're going to keep just by incident, by consequence of that, um, keep all of our software up to date. It's just one of those natural things to fall through. So it seems like a small thing, seems like a little bit of text just to follow version numbers, but they can have pretty consequential impacts if you can stay on top of them. Yeah, luckily we just hired our new developer. So Marcin, welcome. Uh, you're probably in the background listening. Uh, you, we have <laughs> one month in two weeks <laughs> to get to Python 3.x. <laughs> um, but this is really, I mean, for us, right, we we knew the state was coming. Um, it, it was a matter of time for us to uh, get some uh, resources I internally for us, for, so Paul and I in and Marcin can can focus on this. But but what's interesting is, right, you're going to go to a 3.6 or a 3.7 because going to a 3.5, which ends in 10 months, doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think the biggest challenge here is just getting from the 2x to the 3x framework. Once we're there, I think it gets a lot easier uh, to, to move up the, the three stack. But there's a couple interesting ones on here, right? I mean, all those iPhone users, I'm still a 6x user. Um, yeah, that's not, it's still supported, but you know, the hardware is discontinued. There's not much longevity there. So I got to start thinking about my iPhone upgrade path here soon. Maybe Black Friday, maybe not. We'll see. Um, yeah. Uh, the one that was missing on here that I thought was was interesting to be a miss was, is kind of WordPress, right? We see a lot with WordPress out there. I didn't actually see uh, WordPress in this mix for kind of the versions that are out of date, because that is also a very heavily used CMS that, that a lot of people look at. Yeah, and that's a great point. Actually, you brought up two things. One, even just mentioning iPhone, is um, that idea of zero trust networks, beyond corp, whatever phrase you'd like to describe it with, but your developer environment um, you know, you want to make sure that that developer ecosystem, the, the laptops that they're running, the operating system, their IDEs, um, as well as, you know, phones for whether or not they're using the phones for multi-factor or just phones are being granted access into um, something as simple as Jira. Um, these are all interesting and important areas of the security ecosystem to keep track of. So um, being able to know just when is something end of life as well as when is its security and trust boundary really degraded? So you're, I think you're still okay, Matt, that there's um, trusted enclaves and a pretty good um, on-device security for that success, but things that have been improving, and um, you, know, you wanna make sure you'll be able to stay up to date with the latest releases as well. Yes. And I was going to say, so we don't have John here, but I was, uh, I, I, John, if you're listening, hope you are. Um, I'm going to use this segue for you not to uh, tip my hand on a tor editorial bias you might have. But speaking of end of life, um, there's this uh, Docker has been acquired. So, um, and I know, uh, I know, Matt, you have some strong opinions, some strong ideas on this, both just what it means as well as there's that broader conversation of kind of Docker versus Kubernetes that, that goes on quite a bit as well. So um, I'm kind of curious, yeah, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, so let me read the headline first because it's interesting. Marantis's Docker Enterprise Acquisition, a lifeline is industry shifts to Kubernetes. A lifeline to who? Now, the article talks about a lifeline to Marantis. I could make the argument that this is a lifeline to Docker Enterprise. Um, this is a very interesting acquisition for the ecosystem for a second, right? Docker started, what, six, seven years ago as the community edition really brought containerization to the forefront. I mean, definitely Docker is what put containers on the map. But Docker struggled with one very key important uh, element, revenue. Uh, Docker Enterprise was not gaining the 
the traction that other platforms like VMware and or Red Hat's OpenShift were gaining. And we saw over a couple year time frame, because uh, John and I were very close to this when we were at Layered Insight on the container security side, the kind of the evolution of what was going on at Docker. Um, this acquisition to me is um, interesting in, t in, in a couple respects. Number one, both Marantis and Docker Enterprise are struggling. The terms of the deal have not been uh, disclosed, and I don't think they're favorable to either side of this equation, by the way. Docker raised a ton of money, $265, $270 million, um, and this is the outcome of that. Uh, so it, just challenges in general with Docker Enterprise really getting adoption. I think a lot of this has to do when Docker embraced Kubernetes a couple years ago, basically put the fork and swarm, which was kind of the foundation to the enterprise um, platform. So definitely, uh, I think they, they did it to themselves a little bit in this case. So now what? So Marantis owns the Docker Enterprise. Are they going to be able to really go out and compete with Red Hat in this space? Time will tell, but my guess is Red Hat's way too far ahead unless IBM screws them up. What happens to Docker? And this was the interesting part. So Docker gets rid of Enterprise. They're going to focus on Docker Desktop and Docker Hub. And they raised another $35 million to do that. So they're going after the developer. But as we all know, Docker Hub isn't that strong compared to some of the other registries that are out there. And maybe Docker Desktop? I don't know. I'd like your opinion on, on those pieces for a second, Mike. But this is a major shift in the market. Um, and, and just I have a lot of question marks. This does not look good to me when you look at it from what just happened. Yeah, I was trying to come up, you know, I've been trying to think of some some additional, you know, insight to add and to, to follow up on how you've been describing things, because um, I think that's a great description. From the desktop perspective, you know, some some of the aspects I've seen, like there there's a move to put like, um, uh, losing my train of thought, uh, Office. And, and like other, you know, notoriously either insecure or notoriously targeted applications and containerize them so that it doesn't really matter what operating system you're running on, that you can have access to this very nicely unified IDE or office system um, uh, and, and so on. But I don't know that that's really compelling, or I don't know how compelling that is um, for either a broader market. And I, it's not so much, I don't see it from a application security perspective from building applications or from the, the, or I should say, from those who are building them. I do see it as an interesting approach from the perspective of sandboxing and isolating resources. So from a design perspective, it's kind of interesting there. But um, I guess the, the other way I'd kind of take, take this wandering path is also just to point out to containers and cloud service providers, because cloud service providers clearly aren't ignoring this either. And what are we going to start seeing with um, like GKE, EKS, if I'm remembering all of my acronyms correctly, and how developers are going to either embrace those and just say, what's the easy orchestration that's available to me? What is the best way that I can manage from code into deployment and worry the least about complication and have the most API hooks into it so I can do either security, performance, QA, et cetera, testing. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's where my mind is at. And so seeing this is almost a bit of a shrug, especially I guess I'll just go back to that aspect of, in, in my experience, seeing a lot of people or a lot of you know DevOps teams shifting to Kubernetes um, sure, it may be the new hotness, but it also could be um, where the developers are and what tooling that they're embracing. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's the challenge for Mirantis and Docker both in this ecosystem, because now you have your GKE, your EKS, your AKS. You've got a lot of people building out a set of tools across those. You look at what Amazon's built around their stack. Do I need anything else? Now, some will tell you you need that independence. That's great, right? And if you're in a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud, maybe you do want a third-party tool. You're probably going to look at OpenShift first, just, just saying. Um, 
But if you're all Amazon, you're just going to use the native tools. You're not going to use Docker Hub and Docker Desktop and all these other things. And you're not going to use Docker Enterprise, which Marantis now owns. So this is going to create some very interesting challenges, I think, for both organizations because you're seeing lots of other ecosystem players building capabilities across these different platforms that are definitely in a really good position with the developers to continue to build value for them in these environments, and what do you need the other two for anymore? I think that, to me, is the really big challenge. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> and so, so what we'll have to do is make sure we, we bring in John to get his uh, additional thoughts later. Um, <clears throat> shifting from there, so we, we've been talking about you know Docker and how applications are built, basically you know microservices and containers use uh, containers enabling microservices throughout. Um, and another article I pulled out is the websites themselves. And this is another common theme about, um, you know, broadly speaking, we talk about supply chain, but we also talk about, you know, how do you maintain the integrity of your website? And we've chatted maybe a little bit about content security policy. Um, that again is another thing that can be pretty complicated to deploy, or at least complicated to retrofit on legacy applications. But here is an article that I thought we, at, a, at a high level was just making a good description about why we should care or why as developers we should care about the integrity of the content we're serving, as well as some different ways that could be subverted whether it's through a CDN that's compromised, uh, whether it's through, as you uh, were pointing out, like a, an old WordPress version that has been hacked, and so now it's serving some malicious JavaScript. And um, this particular uh, article um, links to three other um, interesting uh, resources that I just wanted to also highlight, securityheaders.com, um, observatory.mozilla.org, as well as hardenize.com. And that last one, hardenize, is from Ivan Ristich. And um, who are hopefully our listeners are aware of him from the um, SSL Labs, which is just a great resource and a free resource for essentially vetting the SSL um, deployment and configuration for a web application. And Hardenize takes that and extends it from the web and TLS configuration into a couple of other um, very important protocols. So DNS, uh, the mail environment. And so I think all these are pretty good in terms of very lightweight, but useful um, monitoring for your web applications, your DNS and your email. Yeah, the big thing here, obviously, is the the JavaScript component, right? <laughs> we, we've we've talked about this before. It this vulnerable nature and its its ability to um, be compromised, and but but it's still a, a an interface a language that everybody uses to to drive their new web apps. And I know John has his opinions on when somebody can come up with a better mousetrap for this. But in, until we get there, I mean, these are the types of issues we're going to have to continue to monitor and protect against because JavaScript is so vulnerable. It is. And um, I threw in that we talk, we've we talked about MageCart. This is one of the um, JavaScript-based um, e-skimmers, card skimmers, essentially, that's been dropped onto um, several um, web applications. And uh, there's also another link to a another one called Pipka now that um, pretty much in the same vein. So here's a little bit of JavaScript could be, in, you know, basically infect a website with it, and it's going to siphon off card data. Um, so the, the, these these threats out there are very um, active. You know, threat actors are pretty active, and it's important for having this a story, if you will, for a mechanism for maintaining the integrity of your site. So that CIA triad: confidentiality, integrity, availability. Integrity is also very important for security. Um, yep. <clears throat> and that leads into this next article on JavaScript again. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So talking about like. Attackers' costs increasing, and there, I, I like the the sense of the, this article. And it's basically um, a lot of information from Synac, from a few other companies, talking about um, basically all is not doom and gloom for companies. And it's talking about um, you know basically bug bounties and how the the bounties are being raised for finding um, vulnerabilities within websites, bug bounty programs, for example, especially with JavaScript. Um, one of the things that I would sort of quibble with or try to de-emphasize is there is a statistic talking about um, 
the the average score of CVSS ratings um, that that was in 2016, the average rating of a CVSS score of in a vulnerability was 6.41, and now it's down to 5.95 in 2018. Honestly, those like two, you know, two digits, two significant digits are kind of meaningless when we're talking about CVSS. It's pretty much it went down from a CVS score of six in 2016 to CVS score of six in 2018. So I kind of don't read that as too much of a difference. And if anything, CVSS, um, as it becomes more used and people want to actually grab and report more CVEs, we also just get a slew of more CVEs being reported, which are a good thing, um, so that vulnerabilities are more easily cataloged and just ha have a universal reference to them. But I think the point is more about what you were just alluding to there at the very beginning, talking about like web applications, JavaScript vulnerabilities, these are the ones that are like the $5,000, $10,000 bounties in, in bounty programs, and primarily because they're so consequential. You can, if you can either inject some malicious JavaScript or have something that is, um, you know, can compromise that website in, in essentially a remote command execution manner, that's essentially game over for that website. Yeah, a, a couple things. CVSS 1, 2, <clears throat> or 3. Pick, pick your scoring version. And, and you're right. right. You, you're basically slightly over a six to slightly under a six. You're still in the middle of the range, right? And I can't take averages seriously here when we've just seen an explosion of vulnerabilities due to bug bounty programs and everything else. Just think about the number of vulnerabilities in the National Vulnerability Database. They're all over the place. And, and so averages aren't really the way to look at this. I, I would be more interested in looking at exploitable vulnerabilities, maybe as a number or by technology, as, as a better indicator than an average score, just personally. Uh, so I, I, you know, to me, you're right, Mike, they're we're roughly the same <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when averages kind of weighed everything out. Uh, but to the point on JavaScript, right? These are five and $10,000 bounties. These are where people are gaining uh, a foothold for breaches that are leading to large data breaches and also large fines. Um, so, you know, obviously, as we focus as um, a security team, these are some of the areas where the focus needs to be, and you're seeing the bug bounties match those to really help prevent some of these larger data breaches. At least we hope yeah, so. I I agree. And I, I'd also want to sort of broaden this is that there, there's a common trope or common phrase that the, the defender has to be right all the time. The def, you know, the attacker only needs to be right one of the times to, you know, define the vuln, which I think is, you know, can sound kind of pithy, pithy, even though I didn't really deliver it that way. Um, but I'd kind of say to tie into our previous segment that from a monitoring perspective, that if you have good monitoring as a defender, the attacker now has to be really careful about making a mistake. So sure, there are plenty of perhaps easy ways to go and pop a web application, but if you are have an RCE on that web app and then inside a container and then starting to pivot, if the defender has a lot of really good monitoring, sure, they may not find that, um, you know, they, they may not have patched the vulnerabilities, but ideally they'll be able to have the monitoring and the alerting to detect that quickly and respond quickly. So we're talking about here about fixing vulnerabilities and trying to actually you know, get off end of life software and having a patch cycle for vulnerabilities. It's a lot less than three months, which I think is the other statistic that um, this particular uh, article called out. But it's also that aspect of that kill chain, if we're talking about the attackers and saying, sure, maybe we didn't patch everything, but hopefully we at least have some logging and monitoring after the fact so that we can have a much quicker response and then ideally a good insight into what was actually performed against our systems. Yeah, I think the big thing here is the tying together prevention, detection, and response together. Because you're going to need all of them across the structure. If you can detect well because you have good monitoring tools, it means you can respond well. And if that response allows you to put a new rule in place that prevents that attack in the future, now I have a mutable infrastructure in the mix that allows me to drop the vulnerable container, bring up the new one with the new rule, or just apply the rule to the running container. And guess what? I just, I just 
stop that potential attack, right? And so to your point, with good visibility inside of the environment, it allows response and prevention mechanisms to work effectively to not only get the attacker out, but prevent the next attack in a similar way. Yeah, I think we're running up to, to the end of the time, but I want to take that in as a segue into one more article. Uh, and, and the title was about soft skills, six non-technical traits CISOs need to succeed. And um, there are two things immediately I want to say is that instead of calling them soft skills, let's just actually call them what they are as social skills, as opposed to just setting up the expectation of like a hard versus soft. And these skills, as they're being described, um, perhaps non-technical skills, but they're not just for CISOs. They're just as applicable to security teams talking to DevOps. Um, to basically have that conversation that you were just describing um, just a few, just a minute ago, Matt, about that prevention, detection, response, and saying, you know, talking with teams, do we have the tools to fall into each of those um, domains? Do we have processes um, that we know how to use for response? Do we have tooling that supports that? And asking these questions in a, you know, as a, in a non-technical manner or in the sense of asking them to say, hey, we're here to collaborate with the team. We're here to work across the organization rather than just make only one team and one team only responsible for all of security and therefore no one else has to worry about it. Um, so I just wanted to highlight this, these particular perspectives so that, um, you know, because it's one of those aspects of security, working with DevOps teams to, as they build out tools, build out processes, these are just good ways to approach that so that everybody wins and they start to, t to understand what responsibility do I need to take on? And importantly, am, am I or is my team equipped um, to be able to take that responsibility on effectively? Yeah, I mean, for the CISO, it's points number three and six. Understand what DevOps is doing because they are driving the business requirements, right? And, and number six yep. talks about talking to the business. These two are very uh, closely linked because what you're seeing is business trying to drive innovation, growth, revenue, et cetera. DevOps is one of those mechanisms. And as a security professional, as a CISO walking in, you need to understand what are the business goals and objectives and what the DevOps team is doing to try to drive those because that's where your integration of security needs to be focused pretty early on because that's where that's where the market's going. Um, so I think three and six in this article are very, very important for CISOs to get their arms around when they walk into an organization. Absolutely. And I'll add the fifth one there um, for application security teams, demonstrate credibility. That's when you come in and start having that conversation about CVSS, for example. And rather than just saying, well, this is a CVSS 8, therefore it has to be fixed. And if you're ignoring the context about, you know, what other mitigating controls may be present that could actually in your environment or the context of this particular application that maybe the score would actually drop down to a four and therefore it's a lot lower priority. That is a much more important conversation to have rather than just sticking to the line of this number means this priority, no exceptions ever. Yes. Cool. I think that's a um, perhaps a, a good way to wrap up our show. We had a great conversation with uh, Pavan about um, Kubernetes containers. And then we also had another conversation today, or just in this segment, about Docker and Kubernetes and containers. And um, look forward to talking with you again, Matt, next week. Um, look forward to John joining us again. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and listening this week. We'll see you again next week on Application Security Weekly.